Welcome to the School of Facilitation Online Gathering and today the topic is improvisation and I've invited the lovely Lucy Taylor to be our guest speaker today. So um, Lucy, can I ask you to introduce yourself? Yes, of course. Um, hi everyone. It's really nice to be with you all this morning. Uh, so I am a facilitator and coach. Um, and I help, so I've got a company called Make Work Play, and I help um, organisations and teams work better together, um, kind of using play and improvisation to help people unlock their flow. Um, so yeah, that's what I do. Cool. So out of curiosity, Lucy and I were wondering, how many of you on here have watched some improvisation before so you could just all type a message in the chat box if you have that capability cool laura what so what have you seen laura they're all on mute right now so yes 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 I, i'm gonna put some money on it a lot of us have seen improvisation one way or the other the, the next question i have we have is um has anyone ever experienced an improv class it looks like magda has Okay. No, yes. Only at school. <laughs> Drama school. Some mini sessions. No. Okay, so a real mix from some of you who've gone through a, maybe a, a learning session and some of you who have not experienced it at all. And as you say, some of you have got vignettes. Can I, can I ask a quick question? Mm. So just for those of you who've seen some improv, what have you seen? Whose line is it anyway? Or yeah, that's the one. I've seen Whose Line Is It Anyway? Comedy. Okay. Maydays. Yay, love the Maydays. Corporate role play. Oh, interesting. Comedy players. Oh, cool. Great. Reality training. Practice in a workshop. Oh, Good. wow. Very cool. Um, so Laura, I thought we'd start with some questions. So guys, what we're going to do is, um, I've got some questions for Laura. Um, take her through a little journey. Um, we're going to talk about how she got to where she is today. What is improv? What does improv look like, sound like, feel like? Um, have a little experience of improv. And then um, towards the end, we'll open it up for questions. And because we're a nice size group, I'll just put everybody on uh, the microphone. So Laura. Lucy. Lucy. <laughs> Laura's. I'm seeing Laura's names down that side. Lucy, um, question, how did you get to where you are today? Uh, so I've been a facil facilitating for about 13 years um, and I started off in research. So I was facilitating focus groups and workshops um, within a market research context. Um, I then worked in government for the COI, which was then the Central Office of Information, which sounds very Orwellian, um, but uh, it kind of ran all the government communications and I used to run big consultations and find ways of making turgid, boring policy discussions kind of interesting and accessible to like Joe Bloggs and Granny in the street. Um, when the Conservatives came in that all got cut so I quit and went travelling and then decided really firmly that I was going to kind of go it on my own, came back, panicked about money and took a job that I really didn't want to take <laughs> um, but while I was there I met this amazing girl who uh, I actually only lasted six weeks in this job and then kind of flagellated myself for quitting but three weeks later this girl who'd started just after me um rang me and told me that they'd fired her i was like what you're amazing so we met for a kind of coffee to lick our wounds and kind of share what had been a slightly traumatic experience for us both and i said oh i just don't know what i want to do now i don't know which direction to go next um and she said have you heard of the do lectures so I don't know if anyone's been to the do lectures. I know Kirsty has. Um, she often displays, oh yeah, a few people have heard of the do lectures. Cool. Well, it's basically a festival of ideas in Wales that happens every April. And it's basically people who've done amazing stuff. And they give 20 minute talks back to back for three days and it's just magical and amazing. So I went on their website and basically trawled through all of their speakers 
um, and got loads of kind of amazing inspiration, but found this guy called Rob Poynton, who set up a company called On Your Feet, and he wrote this book, So Everything is an Offer. And it's basically about, oh yeah, he's also written that one. <laughs> um, it's about how you can apply improvisation to life and work and love and kind of any aspects of your life really and I read this book and it just chimed with everything that I was thinking about and was kind of in my orbit at that time so I sent him an email I was like I'm really interested in what you do I'd love to buy you a coffee didn't hear anything and then about a month later, I was sitting in my pajamas watching something on my computer on a Sunday night and he Skyped me. I was like, oh my God, I can't talk to him. He's like my work idol. Um, so I made some excuse about my camera being broken and we had this chat. And from there, it kind of um, led, that kind of led me on this magical journey and exploration of improv and sent my work off in a completely different direction. So since then, I've been running kind of playful and um, facilitated sessions using improv as the kind of bedrock of my practice and then more recently I did a lot of work with Greenpeace a few years ago um, helping them kind of recreate the story of their organization um, and from there I've got very involved in kind of more nature-based facilitation as well so I've done um, learning journeys at Schumacher College in Devon um, so I did their eco-leadership and facilitation course and I've done some work at Embercoom, which is another it's a sustainable community in Devon, which is really magical. Um, and also trained as a um, constellations facilitator. I don't know if anybody <laughs> I can see love Schumacher College. Yes, me too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, I've just started, trained as a constellations facilitator, which is a kind of embodied facilitation technique. Um, so yeah, it's been a bit of a patchwork, squiggly wiggly journey, but I can say I'm in a place that I really love now with my work. So yeah. It sounds it. Long on your question. But it, yeah, but isn't it almost ironic that the way you came to improv was in an improvised manner in that Rob Painton just, Painton just messages, like Skypes you out of the blue on a Sunday night. And it's like, yes. oh, it's almost like he was giving you an offer and seeing what you're going to do with it. Yeah, well, he was. And then his next offer was he didn't, he, he was in London for one day, but he had a meeting. So did I want to meet him at Paddington Station? And we could chat on the tube on his way to London Bridge. Wow. What a way to see if you're really committed or is, is this right? Is the synchronicity actually is something, something there? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, so what kind of clients do you work with now, Laura? Uh, um, Lucy. <laughs> I'd like to point out Lucy's a friend, by the way, as well. This is embarrassing. Um, so it's really varied. So I do quite a lot of NGO work. So um, Greenpeace, I run kind of open sessions for activists um, about kind of how you can combine improv and activism to create a more playful, kind, mischievous activism. Um, then I also work with corporates, so um, anyone, you know, kind of, I've done a job recently for a company called Mallow Street, who were trying to revolutionise the pensions industry. I've worked with 20th Century Fox. I've worked with um, Dan Humby, who managed all Tesco's data. So really kind of varied. Yes. Who I love working with are people who are slightly, people who are open-minded. Okay. So um, there's a, that's so a, I don't like dragging horses to water, basically. <laughs> well, I'm guessing you can't drag a horse to water to go for improv. You've got to come with some sort of curiosity and openness. Yeah. yeah. So um, what is your approach to facilitation and training then, if it's embedded with improv? Yeah, so I guess that, well, it's about, um, it's very hands-on. So I'm, I'm a bit anti sitting around and talking. <laughs> so I think a lot of work is very rational and linear and logical and we discuss and we debate. And so I try and design things that are completely counter to that. So I never have any tables. Um, I, we always sit in a circle. I'm a big, um, kind of fan of getting people like up and doing and playing as a way of exploring concepts um, and then more recently so often I try and get people the workshops I do have some 
nature-based aspect, whether that's just getting people to pay attention to um, kind of their surroundings as they come to the workshop or whether it's actually in nature. Um, Because I think that's grounding and it helps us notice and it gives us perspective. And then also being very embodied. So using our bodies as a um, kind of tool to listen to what's really going on. So, you know, listening to your gut rather than just your head and trying to get other people kind of into that space Um, and creating a, a joyful space where people can laugh and play and just step into a slightly different space to they the one that they perhaps yeah. inhabit normally. And what impact does that have on the group when you bring that style of facilitation to them? So I think sometimes people come to, to it with like preconceptions, like, are you kidding me? You're going to make me do improv. I want to run for the hills, leave me alone. <laughs> and other people are like, yeah, improv, where's the stage? Let me get on it. Um, <laughs> And so it often sounds, so to some people it often sounds quite scary, but the way I do it is very safe. So we do a lot of paired work um, and you kind of build up to, you build people up and what it does, I mean, just get people laughing. And I think that breaks down a lot of barriers and a lot of fear. And you are able to move into a place where people are spending time as human beings rather than colleagues or workers. Mm Um, which I don't think I mean some organizations cultivate that but I think often people bring their work self to work and not their whole self and I'm big on like bringing your whole self um, to work I was always when I worked at Diageo some of you know I used to work there and I could never work out how some of my friends who I knew really well outside of work they sort of managed to click and switch their personality style when they came into the office Mm. whereas I was just me I, I didn't have this and I, I'm glad I didn't have this ability to like put on a second face. Yeah. It does, I don't think it serves you. And it takes an awful lot of energy to be something you are not just to fit yeah. into somebody else's preconceived idea or, or culture. But it's not one person, is it? It's a, a mass thing in a culture. Yeah, yeah. There's and I think if you've got like the Venn diagram of you and your, your kind of her, your real self and your work self. I mean, my goal in my life is to like make those things. Yeah one yeah yeah and um now that i've worked for myself it is all one <clears throat> so if you know me outside of work is i am the same inside of work and <laughs> the only thing i have to edit sometimes is uh my vocabulary because it can i swear quite comfortably and suddenly realize that some nationalities don't like you swearing but that's besides yeah. the point anyway back to you um so to the crux point, which I'm sure everyone's sitting there, especially if they've got a high extra thinking energy. What has improvisation got to do with facilitation and training? Well, can I throw it? I will answer that. Can I throw it to the group? Like, what do you yeah. think improvisation might have to do with facilitation? I love it. <laughs> <laughs> this is the only weird thing, isn't it, about working with a... Uh, Okay, hyper creativity, going with what comes. Yeah, anything else? Stretches people, responding to uncertainty. We improvise every day, making things up. (laughs) Yes, we do. More effective exercises. Thinking on your feet opens the mind. Yeah, a way of removing our masks. Yes. 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 So all of these things. (laughs) So I'm just going to go now. (laughs) Job Um, done. Responding (laughs) to other people. Responding to other people. Yes, absolutely. So, I, I mean, I always think about, um, like, doing a facilitation job. It's kind of like a performance. So you have an audience. You're having to manage a crowd of people. You're having to show up fully and do your thing. Um, and I think what improvisation teaches you to do is be really present. So, like, really noticing what is going on in the moment. So I'm sure you have all experience like planning a session in detail and then you know it goes out the window halfway through and you realize actually it's not what's needed in that moment and that is what improvisation is about it's about noticing what is actually going on rather than what you want to be going on Mm -hmm. and staying with that and working with that um I think you know as an improviser if anyone's seen any live stuff often they like take suggestions from the audience so the title of the story you know the theme the genre and that's what we do when we're facilitating you know we are 
kind of garnering opinions and ideas and thoughts and and you don't know what those are going to be in advance so you're having to you know like you mm. said in the chat like you're having to respond to the uncertainty and just work with what comes in the moment mm. um, and improvisation is an amazing tool for getting comfortable and fluent and yeah it's just, just really kind of confident at doing that okay and you have shared with me that there are some principles to improvisation and i was wondering can you share that with the group is that possible to headline yeah. them yeah yeah, yeah. um so imp- so if you watch improvisation on stage like the first time i saw any i was like oh my god this is magic like this is blowing my mind it's so amazing and i was really addicted to, to it so, and i still love it but i was like properly addicted you know i'd go all the time and the more i went so there's a great if you haven't been and you're ever in london <laughs> on a Wednesday and Sunday night at the um, comedy store near Piccadilly. Yeah. The comedy store players play, and that was set up by Mike Myers and Paul Merton off, is often in it, and um, Josie, I can't remember her last name, but anyway, it's brilliant. Yeah. So I went loads to this, and, and as I went more, I was like, oh, okay. So the, the kind of, the rules and the practices behind it began to show themselves. So what first appeared like magic, then I was like, okay, so there is a, there are like rules underpinning this. And Rob, in his book, Everything's an Offer, I'll show you again, he (laughs) sent these up in six words. So let go, notice more, and use everything. So the idea of letting go, anyone got any ideas what you might be letting go of? What might you have to let go of? Inhibitions, yes. Fear, yes. Knowing the answers, structure, expectations, yep. Self, mm, I like that, yeah. So exactly, a plan, yes. So, <laughs> all these things. And I think, <clears throat> I mean, for me, expectations is always a big one. And, you know, kind of caring about what others think. Um, and in, in kind of letting, and also, we, so in improv, we talk about shadow stories. Um, you know, my stories, there's someone sat in the front row who's like, the boss's boss and he looks really grumpy and oh god I think he hates what I'm doing that's a shadow story that's a story that I'm telling myself and it's completely unhelpful so how do we let all these things go and throw them out the window so you're letting go of control really and these these three principles are quite interlinked so you've got let go notice more so that's about being really present so you're listening intently improvisers are brilliant at listening and um, you're looking so Kirsty's nodding if we're in a scene an improv and she's nodding I might be like oh yes so you like my plan Kirsty so you're picking up on um the uh physical cues on the um on what you're hearing and you're using everything that um presents itself on you know you're you're having to you're having to pull things out of thin air when you're improvising on stage so you know you might use the color of the carpet or um, the clock on the wall as a something to give you inspiration for where you're going um, in your scene next. So that's um, notice notice more. That kind of gives you access to the abundance of stuff that's around us every day. And then use everything is linked to that. So um, the title of Rob's book is Everything is an Offer. And that kind of sums that up really. It's like everything that presents itself, whether it's a challenge or um, an offer, um, we can use it to our advantage and as improvisers we can use it and as facilitators you can use it you know if, if you're in a facilitation setting and somebody says hang on I really disagree with that or no I just dis- no that's not how it is you know that's a that's an offer you know that's a no is sometimes a request for more information how do we turn these things into something that we can use so it's really a mindset of um, taking the curveballs and the things that are unexpected and that are thrown at us and using them to create something really rich and exciting. Cool. And, and just as I listen to you and I think about the principles I've always applied in my training facilitation, so let go. I definitely, at the beginning of my journey, I was more worried about what I was doing and how I showed up. <clears throat> and therefore, I got in the way a lot of yeah. what essentially is an okay session but that's like all the answers the guys gave you know people hold on to the structure of their sessions at, to begin with because that's the safety um our inner voices are absolutely brilliant at telling us 
you know, the fear piece, you know, the story of we are not good enough and why would anyone come and listen to us and work with us? So that's part of our own, I think, journey as facilitators and trainers to do that inner work and just to start to almost just breathe sometimes and allow ourselves to let go. <clears throat> um, the notice more piece is that is just so true. You've just got to be present and in that space. When you are standing in that training room, if you aren't and your mind is distracted and you are thinking about other things, you just miss and you miss and you miss cues, you miss just seeing and hearing, but also you start to miss what you can pick up from an energetic perspective. Um, and then use everything. That used to be one, you know, you'd think, oh, please don't disagree with me or you get the challenges. And I would just be in absolute fear of that happening. And now I'm like, yeah, bring it on. This is the best bit. It's where you get a really juicy conversation. Yeah. And it's just knowing how, what you can say back in a way that invites the conversation versus turns it into a slagging match, which I've also seen some facilitators and trainers do where it suddenly goes, oh my God, that's really awkward and embarrassing. So having some tools and techniques available to you to, as you say, um, use everything, take the offer, whatever guise it comes in, I think is really invaluable. Yes, yes, yes. And, and I think, go on. I was going to say, in the improvisation, as you've learned, is that what you've also taken away? Like some of those skills, the, I think it's a lot of about language as well as self. Have you picked up a lot of skills in that space to help you let go, notice more, use everything? Yeah, and I mean, there's, so just by kind of practice, you know, playing and practicing improv, you get, it just kind of opens up a different sort of awareness. So right different ways of listening, different ways of being. And um, there's a really great piece of language that underpins improvisation, which is yes and. Um, I don't know if anyone plays with this or uses it, Kirsty, great. Um, and what, it, so, you know, we're, we're very used to saying, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, or no, or, so the, using the phrase yes and, Nikki loves that sound, great. <laughs> it forces you to, listen to what the other person has said and build on it and it's it's yeah. inherently collaborative and creative and generous and i think just going back to what you were saying um one of the big kind of things that improvisers do for each other is they make each other look good and what that does is it takes it takes the worry away from whether you're looking good and it stops you thinking about um the clever thing that you're going to say next to make yourself look good in front of the group and actually puts the owner your focus on the other people so my my responsibility in an improvisation setting is to make Kirsty look amazing and Kirsty's responsibility is to make me look amazing and that is very freeing so if your job as a facilitator is to like make your group look amazing it's a lovely place to be yeah I always start if I'm thinking about designing something new or if I'm creating anything it's about um the learners are at the heart of what we do it's not about the business i'm working with it's not about me it's not about the, the main sponsor who yes could be in the room it's about the learner at the heart mm -hmm. and when you start to hold that principle i know it shifts language it shifts your perspective um and i think that's sort of a same same but different to what you're describing in terms mm -hmm. of you know you're, you're there to make the other people look great and i think that's fantastic in terms mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. it's a very open-hearted way of working Yes. Whereas in old way, we weren't taught that. It was often self and you started with you and it was all about you and made sure. And I think that's why people came with that very defensive shield and style of being mm -hmm. uh, when they show up sometimes. Um, what else have you, in terms of improv and facilitation, where you've made links um, in the past? So we've got those three principles and you mentioned yes and. Is there anything else you could share with us at this point that you think would be useful for the team in their um, learning? Well, there's lots of, we could, should we do a game? Yeah, let's play a game. Guys, do you want to play a game? Just stick a yes or a no in the chat box. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, anyone? <laughs> <laughs> I'd be really upset if there was a no in there. So I think, well, we can, I, it's going to be a bit difficult to do it on mass. So maybe Kirsty and I'll demonstrate and then you guys can go and play it with your kids or your colleagues or your partner yeah. so they can join in as well maybe yeah 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 so um let's do okay so there's a game called swedish story i don't know if anyone is familiar with this um it's a storytelling game as often improvisation games are 
And so I'm going to tell a story and Kirsty is going to throw in words to the story that I have to incorporate. Um, and as we're going through it, like listen to the story and just like be notice, like just be noticing what, what just notice. Can these guys add words to the chat box if they want to? Yeah. So that would be great. So if you, if you've got a word you want to see in the story, chuck it in the chat box. And I will then feed it to Lucy. Yeah, great. And can we, so we need a title. So has anyone got suggestions for the title of a story? No pressure. Ooh, one ten six. The Lion Heart. My life as a Yeti. <laughs> <laughs> I'm keen me Oh gosh, so much rich. I think I'm going to go for My Life as a Yeti. It's not what you think. Oh, this is another good contender. Um, Kirsty, you choose. Oh, well, I quite like I keen meatballs. <laughs> okay, I keen meatballs. Right. So the trick with this is you don't start in the first person, so you start in the third person. Mm-hmm. Does anyone, does someone want to um, give me a character name? Who's, who's our main character in our Ikean meatball story? Jim. Okay. Jim was walking through the docks in Southampton. He, oh, I'm sorry, just going to say, so chuck in words into the chat box. Yeah. In the story. And Kirsty, if you don't see any words in the chat box, you just chuck I'll make some up. Okay. Okay, Jim was walking through the shipyard in Southampton. He was a docker. He'd worked in the docks for many years. Poppies. He'd seen them change from a small yard, just kind of taking in the odd container ship to this kind of enormous undertaking that it was now. He was walking by the um, edge of the of the dock and he saw that between the... Um, between the, rut, the ruts in the road, there were poppies growing, and he thought, that's so lovely. Spring is on its way. Thank you. Um, he looked up to the left, and there was a ship coming in. It was the Green Panther. It was from, it come from all the way Turtle. from Japan. What was the last one? Turtle. Um, and inside it were some illegal turtles that had been Busted. poached. Um, by some horrible whalers in Japan and he thought right I'm gonna have to report this he got out his lunchbox because he thought I can't do anything serious until I've like had a decent lunch he opened the bird's eye custard pot that his wife had kindly packed him umbrella and he sat on a box in the yard having his custard it started to rain and he thought oh bugger so he got his umbrella out and that was okay he loved a bit of rain um, so he was quite comfortable sitting there for now. He ate his biscuits and then he thought, right, I've got to go and do something about this. So he marched Jeez. over to the dock authority and he um, said, look, buddy, what was the last one? Shoes. Look, buddy, this is not OK. We can't be importing turtle meat in this day and age. What do you think you're doing? And the guy said, look, mate, I've got to provide for my family. My kids need shoes. Wisdom tooth. My kid needs food. My wisdom tooth is broken. What do you want me to do? And he said, I want you to do better. Posh deli. What was that one? Posh deli. He said, look, buddy, I'm not asking you to buy your food from your posh deli. All you do is eat, like, you can just be getting Ikean meatballs for your children. You don't need to be going to your posh deli anymore. What was the last one? Curtains. Um, you know, you can use the curtains to make clothes for the kids. We do not need to be importing turtle meat. This is not good for the planet. Middle class. The guy in the dock office thought for a minute and thought, but I've got middle class, asp- said, I've got middle class aspirations. And so Jim said, look, buddy. Come in. I think that is not the way forward. The way forward is to pool our resources. So I think we should create a commune. Sausages. The dock man thought for a second longer and said, all right, let's do it. He took out a plate of sausages from the fridge inside the office and he handed one to Jim. He said, here you go, buddy. Let's share our sausages. Jim raised his eyebrows and shook his hand and said, we've got a pact. And that was the start of the Ikean meatball commune that saved the turtles from certain destruction. 
Round of applause. Yay, brilliant, very good, loved it. <laughs> clap, 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 clap. Very good. Wow, so, Lucy, you made, <laughs> you made that look so easy. <laughs> now, um, I appreciate this is your art, and uh, no, this is a bit funny scene. No, 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 I just want to debunk that. So you are all entirely capable of doing exactly what yeah. I did. Um, what, so, Kirsten, can I, so what did it, what, well, what did you notice, guys? What did it, yeah, good what question. did it take? What did it require to do that? So someone, Dave said, could tell when you got into the flow. Yeah, okay. So what, what, how did you, how could you tell? So if... Flexibility, says Laura, H. Yeah. I noticed um, you're really, you pace your voice. So there's a slowing pace to your everyday speaking voice. Yes. Be my observation. Yes. So you're kind of buying yourself time. Interesting that you didn't just use the new word straight away. You continued your story until it was the right moment. Yes. Or until my brain, you, that makes it sound a bit like a bit more deliberate. I was just kind of trying to scramble towards a way of using the word. You drew it to conclusion to include the title aspects of the story. Yes, and finding an ending is quite hard and it takes practice, but it's really great if you can do it. And I think um, that is often the way in facilitation. So finding an ending to a discussion or mm. sensing yes. that it's time to like draw things to a close is really important. And often, you know, we're not sure and we want to let things keep going, but it's good to end things and to call it sometimes. But do you not find that you can sense when that's right, though? You've, for me, I've learned when to let it flow and when to bring that conversation to a natural conclusion. You, so that, for me, is a felt sense rather than yeah. a, like, now is the right time. Yeah, I think it's felt and it's like, you know, there's some... So with the story, there's, like, you can see it's come full circle and you can see... So there's an intellectual piece and a felt sense, I yeah. think. But it's definitely something that you learn. So didn't have expectations on what to say yet. Next, yeah, you have to kind of let go of like where you think it's going. Keep the narrative going, yeah. The pace came up and your ideas started to, to link. And I think that's important because you start out with a bunch of random ingredients, which is often, you know, in an improv scene, it's like, where is this going? And in a facilitated conversation, you know, you've got bits and pieces and somebody says this and it takes time to discover the narrative of that in both cases. Words were introduced across the senses, didn't just see each of the things. Yeah, but more experiences. People always want to revisit it though. Yeah, and make sure the discussion is most funny. Yes, yes. And actually, um, I think there's that, that idea of the balance between ordinary and extraordinary is really important. So for storytelling, absolutely. You need the boring and mundane things in order for the other things to look brilliant. And I think in, with organisations, the same is true. So like getting the, the kind of everyday and the basics um, out on the table is as important as, you know, the brilliant thing that they're going to do. And I think yeah. the balance to allow both sorts of conversations is really important. Yeah. Ooh. Else, what else would you draw out? Just so, if have we missed anything, is there anything else that you would add to our noticings? Yeah, I think there's this idea of like holding things lightly. So you mm. know, initially you might have a sense of where something's going, but not holding on to it too tight. Yeah, and I think, yeah, that applies like you know with a set a session plan or you know the output of a strategy session, like not being attached to the outcome. Yes. I talk about um, when you're designing, and I talk about this in de design classes, you, we need to be clear on the purpose, like why are we create, what, why is this class being created or the solution we're creating and what are the outcomes that are both business and learner focused? I said you create those and, and they are part of your plan and I think you genuinely need them, other, otherwise you're just wafting through the ether. Yeah. But you then create those Yes, you can create a, a structure and whatever that structure form looks like for you. And then I'm like, you just hold it really lightly and be prepared for it to come totally out of the water and be prepared to shift and move the blocks as required. Mm. Um, whereas if you hold yourself really structurally into those plans or those workshop 
just because you've designed it like that, you weren't in the energy, you weren't in your space when you were designing it. You might be like me sitting here in the office, but when you finally stand in the room yeah. and then you've got the group, they are adding into that structure. And you're yeah. like, okay, something's got to shift and change because actually it's not flowing. Yeah. And, and that I think is um, progression when facilitators and trainers start to be able to feel like they can let go and feel comfortable with knowing they still get to the outcome that they need. And I, so I think, I feel like Kirsty, you've just kind of answered that question. So how do you deal with the need for certainty from corporate clients? I, uh, so I would say like just getting really, making sure you've got like really clear agreement with them on what they want the yeah. outcome to be. But then, you know, there's more than one way of getting there. And I think it's, it's often trust, like they need to trust you. And I think senior clients probably are better at doing that than if you're working with someone more junior within an organization. Yeah. And I often explain to the client, Laura, up front, that when we, we agree the purpose and the outcomes together, and I'll say to them, I, I, and I draw this now, I, all my agendas are drawn. I rarely write them up unless it's for something like a global project. But everything's draw, hand-drawn, and I explain to them, this is the flow I'm recommending. But actually there will probably be shift depending on what shows up in the room um, and as you just said Lucy the trust piece then allows I build that as well in conjunction so that you can then make a recommendation if you have to halfway through the day that you're going to shift and change and often if the clients in the room with you they can see that it's needed and it's absolutely fine but the communication is really important that a you're you're sharing that at the even before you get into the workshop, there's something may shift and change, but you've got all the tools in your back pocket ready to do that. Yeah. Um, and then the conversation as you're going through the day, I think it's really helpful. Um, it's coming up to quarter to t uh, 11 and I'm really conscious this is like a one hour session. So guys, I'd love to open up the floor to all of you to ask Lucy questions. So I'm gonna unmute um, everybody, if you wish to be unmuted, that is. Um, and if you'd like to ask Lucy a question about improvisation, what she does, you would be more than welcome. Hi, Kirsty. It's Dave. Hey, Dave. Hi there. Um, <laughs> hi, uh, Laura. Look, really interesting. And um, I'm I'm a, I'm a I'm a massive. Oh, am I just? Mm, apologies. Um, I'm, I'm a massive fan of um, of flow generally. Actually, it's something that Kirsty introduced me to. Actually, I'm, I'm reading prolifically around it. Um, I just wondered if there's any um, kind of sort of tactical stuff you use to manage yourself if in a um, flow, um, a facilitation session on, of any, of any guys where you start to lose control a bit and you realize you get a little bit anxious, you fall yeah. out of flow, you start, you know, your the improvisation gets a little bit lost. Yeah. Just wonder if there's anything yeah. you do to regain yeah. control yeah. at that moment. Um, well, it sounds really simple, but breathing. So I'd say breath is the most important, is your most important tool as a facilitator. So, <clears throat> sorry, I just got a frog in my throat. I once um, did this, participated in somebody else's workshop um, where there was a bunch of choral singers and um, we, were we were like, it was with a bunch of conductors. And so we did a bunch of exercises where we were just communicating physically with our hands. And then the, it built up to the last exercise where we had to get up and conduct this choir. And we didn't know what they were gonna sing and they, you know, they just started and we had to conduct. And the first time I did it, I've, you know, I've sung in choirs, I'm a bit musical, and I did it, and it was great. Like, the guy was like, hmm, okay, I'm going to make this a bit harder. When the, when the singers feel inspired by you, they're going to stand up, and when they don't feel inspired by you, they're going to sit down. So I was like, bring it on. And I started with kind of great gusto, and they all stood up. And then one by one, they all sat down, and I was like, started panicking and I started like you know conducting harder and faster and then I just thought right so I was like I'm not breathing so I took a great big breath dropped my shoulders and they all stood up so it was it was for me it was this amazing moment that showed this like direct correlation between me breathing and me inspiring other people and I think um, I mean, sometimes I say in my workshops, like breathing is a revolutionary act. And I really believe that, like 
think when you're, you know, when you're panicking or you're like, you feel like things are getting out of control, just taking a few deep breaths can be so grounding and powerful. Um, and then I think the other thing is just to note, like notice, like, you know, look out the window, what can you see? So basically anything that like gets you out of your monkey brain um, and gets you back into the room and noticing um, would be my advice in those situations. Thanks, Dave. Good question. Marvellous. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Pleasure. <laughs> okay, somebody else who's got a question. And if you want to put your video on like Dave just did, that was lovely. Yeah, it's really nice. Yes. So let me put everyone on the spot. This is your offer, guys. You've got to do the yes and moment when you're thinking. <clears throat> How about involving people who don't want to be involved? Mm. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so the way I tend to get around that is by not doing anything too exposing. So you start off with paired exercises and games. And I try and build in... Uh, build in kind of different so improvisation kind of tends to appeal more to extrovert the extroverts and the introverts so like making ways of that making ways of finding ways of making that feel safe so which is about like small groups not getting people to like stand up in front of a room mm. um, and then also like different modes for different types of people so over the course of workshop thinking like okay there's some stuff where we're sharing stories and we're discussing and talking there's some stuff that's like individual and it's quiet working and we're just writing stuff so you've got different modes um you've got different modes and then i think different types so there's a great exercise called one two four all that i often use and that is and it you know it might be after you've heard a presentation or you've i don't know you've done an exercise and it's a way of feeding back so um, number one, so one is you have one minute on your own, just jotting down your thoughts. Two, you have two minutes in a pair discussing. Um, four, you have four minutes in joining with another pair and then all you bring the whole group together. So it's just a way of um, making sure everybody is um, involved. And I think, but I think also you've got to put the responsibility back onto the people in your workshop. So if you've got someone who's sat there with their arms folded and they're not listening and they're on your phone, like sometimes just call it out and you know we're all grown-ups we're all responsible for bringing ourselves you can't bring people along who are kind of yeah exactly really to be there um, and actually also on that um lucy i use something similar you use one two four all as in it from a timing perspective but i would do often you know get people in that reflection space do their own thing of thinking talk to the person next to you share your thoughts yeah. um, and then when you ask a question, it's a general question to the whole group versus a pointed question with a name on it yes. to someone. Yes. Um, but the introverts want to participate just as much as the extroverts. Often they just don't have the, um, they just don't get an opportunity because the extroverts are straight in there, hands up, talk, 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 talk. And sometimes it's up to us again to recognize what's going on and um, sort of smooth that out and do it in a way that works for them. Yeah. Um, Nikki had a lovely question. How do you set up your session for continued mm. use in the workplace? Mm. Yeah, this is really a great question and I don't think I've necessarily solved it for myself. Um, I think things like yes and are great as a tool and a piece of language that often sticks within a business. Mm. Um, sometimes I work with groups, you know, in a kind of coaching capacity. So like kind of created doing like creative coaching with people helping them like explore their edges like following a session um and sometimes you know work with like management teams around instilling kind of rituals and you know how do we run our meetings differently um are there like particular times of the day or week when we kind of celebrate or reflect so helping people look at the rhythms of the way they work and looking at how you can build some of these ideas and ways of being yeah. into that. How do you find the horses who are ready at the water? That is a good question and I don't really have a scientific answer. <laughs> Often it's like somebody will really love what you do and they'll talk to 
you know, their friends slash colleagues who are a bit like them and be like, oh, there was this great thing. So it's really word of mouth. Um, yeah. If you find out the answer, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> um, in terms of, you've mentioned um, Rob's book. Feel free to share it up again. So I will put this in an email to everybody so that they can see it. Um, everything's an offer, how to do more with less, Rob Poynton. Where, what other resources have you, do you use? Or, oh, she's coming up. Okay. So this is um, a colleague of mine called Steve Chapman, who is amazing. And he wrote a book called Can Scorpion Smoke? He also does, I mean, lots of brilliant things. Like he did an unconference this year called In Expert, where people gave talks on things about which they were an expert. And he kind of is great on creativity and playing with uncertainty. Um, I go to, so who, somebody said they've been seen the May Days. Um, so there's a great, he, Steve runs this thing called Super Secret Musical Improv. So if uh, anyone can go, it's once every three months or so and you just spend the day, yeah, the lab. You spend the day um, kind of making up stupid songs and it's delightful and brilliant and hilarious. Um, and yet Steve also does a thing called The Lab, which is basically an experimental space for facilitators. So you can go along with an experiment or you can just go along and be experimented on. Mm -hmm. um, and that is a great, that's a great way of, for me of pushing my own practice. So recently I did one where I, I do quite a lot of storytelling work and I've just started doing this constellations work as well. And I wanted to see if you could constellate a story. And you know, mm -hmm. it was fab and we did it and it was really interesting. And um, there's also Keith Johnston is the kind of grandfather of improvisation and he's got a few really great books. One is called Impro, The Storytellers. Um, the other one is escaping me, but yeah, if you Google Keith Johnston, um, he is fabulous. And so in terms of your facilitation, and since you have been embodying improv and bringing it very much to life, and I know you teach it, and, but use it in other ways when you're doing your storytelling workshops, what is the one thing that you've noticed, maybe for you, that's really shifted as a result of using improv principles? I mean, my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's like, by, in discovering improv, I've just moved to a space of like accepting offers and, and just becoming really comfortable with not knowing. Yes. So I remember when I was much younger, I'd, I'd if someone said, would you like to go for a coffee? I'd be like, but why are we going for coffee? What, what's like the purpose of the meeting? And I, you know, really wanted to like know and not feeling at all comfortable with just, well, let's just see what happens. Let's like, you know, I don't know what's going to happen, but that's fine. So just a, a kind of deep comfort. With yeah. That. Well, a much, not always, but a much deeper comfort of sitting with the unknown and, and the kind of fertility of that space of not knowing. Yeah. So um, just as you tell that story, I get a really excited feeling in my tummy because mm -hmm. how Lucy and I met is at a co-working space in Winchester. And I've never ever worked in a co-working space and I don't know what made me do it, but about October last year, I sort of signed up to it. And the first day I'm in having my chemistry, I'm walking around the building and I meet Lucy and me being me um, quite openly said to Lucy and everybody I met that day oh what do you do and Lucy said oh I'm a, a facilitator and a coach so you can imagine my ears absolutely prick up and I say oh and what do you do what kind of facilitation and she said improvisation well I am the giddiest person alive because one of the things I've been wanting to do is bring improv to the school of facilitation because I've known having read Rob's book and been on a few workshops, what improvisation principles can bring to our work. So within two seconds, Lucy and I have taken ourselves out the main room, we're having a cup of coffee and I'd invited her to come over to my house to go for a walk for the morning and I basically pitched to her that I thought it'd be a really bloody good idea if she came and got to know School of Facilitation and maybe ran some workshops. <laughs> and that, my lovely friends who are listening, is how we then get to where we are today in that I said to Lucy, could she come on and talk to everybody about what improv is and how it shows up? So if you think about your story of how improv has changed, 
in the past if someone had said to you that come and come to my house come hang out let's go walking and make a plan you may have said no in the past because you might have been thinking who's this crazy lady <laughs> um but what we have gone and done guys is um lucy is gonna host a improv class for school of facilitation on friday the 8th of march in london in a nature reserve we found which is very exciting um, it's going to be from 10 o'clock in the morning until four o'clock in the afternoon. And we've got an early bird price available right now for £249. So there are a maximum of 12 places. Uh, and we, you guys are the first to know about it, even though it's been up on my website, I haven't done a formal launch. So if people are interested and you would like to come along, um you would be more than welcome and we will send you out an email just so you get that information um before we go this morning and does anyone have any more questions that you'd like to ask lucy and i've got your name right that time please well done kirsty i've got a qu uh, one last question it's dave again hi dave Go for it, Dave. Hi, hi, Lucy. And apologies for getting your name wrong earlier and calling you Laura. <laughs> um, um, so um, I was wondering, Lucy, uh, you know, um, I'm fascinated by flow and I guess that's part of this to some degree or another. And um, I was wondering with your delegates, um, whether yes, you no explain what flow is or you get into the science of of kind of the, the sort of hyper improv state so they kind of understand it. I wonder if you kind of that helps you to get them into a flow state or not. So do you ever sort of go into that? No, I don't, but I'd love to have a chat with you about it if you're into it. Um and I think it's probably I think some people that probably need that. I think I very much lean towards the let's just get on and do it and experience it and then discuss what we notice. But I think you know, some people really like having that kind of explanation as well as um, it's not something that I do, but you know, I'd love to find out more about what you've been digging into. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess you're right. It just depends on who your consumer is, doesn't it? Some, are, it, they'll just be instantly switch off, but some are actually quite, quite interested. So, uh, so yeah, look, I'm happy to speak any, any time. I'm, I'm still very much upskilling in this area, but so I can't give you any expertise. expertise. Uh, but anyway, yeah, it, good to talk. But yeah, really enjoyed it. Thanks. Great, great pleasure. Thanks. Any other questions? I've had lots of um, feedback in terms of it's been really useful, really great. Thank you very much. Fun. Mm -hmm. Interesting topic and a great session. Good. Uh, which book would you recommend to start with, Lucy? Maybe Do Improvise by Rob Poynton. Great. Because it's like short. And I mean, I love everything's an offer. It's a bit longer. Do Improvise, you can stick in your pocket and take on the tube. Absolutely. And it's, I read it in a day, well, not even a day, an afternoon, and ended up turning over so many pages. I'm going to have to go back and see what I turned over. Yeah. Guys, I'd like to say um, a massive thank you to Lucy for being our guest yeah. today. Um, thank you for those who have joined us. And if you're listening on playback, thank you very much. Um, Lucy, thank you. Pleasure. Take care. For having me. <laughs> no, go well. And we'll speak again soon, team. Bye, everybody. Bye.